This Engine Noise podcast is sponsored by 1AAuto.com. Quality car parts that ship quickly and come with thousands of free online how-to videos that will walk you through your installs. Let me write this down, Jeremy. 1AAuto.com. Got it. You're writing that on your hand mat? Yep. uh, That way I won't forget. Hey, welcome to Engine Noise, a brand new podcast for do-it-yourselfers like me who don't mind getting their hands dirty. I'm your car expert, Jeremy Nutt. I have a bit of experience working on cars and buying and selling cars. And I have none. And here we have Matt. Not so much a car expert, but I know some things. That's why we make a great team, Matt. I know car things, and you know everything else. Sure. It's a dream team. Yeah. So this is the first episode of Engine Noise, and we figured with a name like that, we should probably start off by talking about engines. Sounds good. Vroom vroom. And one of my favorites is, of course, the Wankel. Uh, say what now? What is a Wankel? <laughs> a Wankel is the type of engine that's in a Mazda RX-7 or an RX-8. I don't know the full history of the Wankel. I'm, I'm going to be honest. But if I had to guess, I would say that there was a guy named Wankel in uh-huh. like the 50s or 60s. That's the person that invented this engine design and worked with Mazda to come up with it in an actual production vehicle. And once it was in a production vehicle, then it sort of spread out all over the place and got into motorcycles and snowmobiles and a variety of other weird things. Okay. Wankels are an awesome engine because you can sort of like add on to them. It's not like a normal engine that you would find in a car. They don't have pistons. How does an engine not have a piston? I don't get that. (laughs) The way that an engine doesn't have a piston is if it has a rotor instead. So imagine a Dorito. Okay, love Doritos. Yeah, so imagine a Dorito, and it has a pencil right through the middle of it. Okay. You spin the pencil, and the Dorito spins around. But now make this all out of metal and put a spark plug next to the Dorito. And every time the spark plug lights, it pushes the Dorito a little bit. And then it lights again and it pushes the Dorito a little bit more and it spins the pencil. That pencil is your crankshaft, which then turns your wheels and makes the wheels move. Does this make any sense or am I just talking about Doritos? I'm hungry. You're hungry. Oh, you're hungrier than you were. Okay, perfect. (laughs) So moral is inside the engine is basically two spinning Doritos made out of metal. And it's a very unique engine, but they're really cool engines because they have very few moving parts. There's really only like a crankshaft down the center of the engine, which is like every engine on earth. That's how they all work. I didn't know that, so. Yeah, if you pop open any engine, you're going to find a crankshaft in the middle of it. And that's if I basically... pop open any engine, it's a problem. <laughs> yeah, it's by mistake, <laughs> and you're on the side of the road. Um, I'm calling you. Bring your wankle. <laughs> so yeah, inside every engine is a crankshaft, and inside a wankle is a rotor attached to the crankshaft. And it's just the simplest possible engine design, and it's very lightweight. So, for example, a 1.3 liter wankle might make 220 horsepower. What does that of... mean? So let's say you have a Chevy truck. It might have a 350 cubic inch engine or a 5.7 liter size. So that's mm-hmm. like the total area of the combustion space in the engine. When all the pistons go down in their bore, you measure the distance between the bottom of their bore and their top of their bore, and all that space in between is like the volume of the cylinders is how many liters it is, or you can convert it to cubic inches and find out the amount of space in there. So is Um, it the more liters, the more powerful? Generally, yes. Wankel engines are sort of an exception to that, because when you talk Wankels, you're pretty much talking 1.3 liter Wankels. If you can get 200 horsepower out of 1.3 liters compared to 200 horsepower out of 5.7 liters, that's a whole lot less total volume of space that you're getting power from. So it's basically a way smaller engine. You can just pick up the engine and you could run around the block with it. It's not huge and heavy and, well, maybe you can run around the block with it, (laughs) but you could definitely like pick it up. For the most part, it's a much lighter engine. They usually set them really low and far back in the car so they can make the car balance really well. It's just a really cool engine to have. So you could put like four of them in there. Well, yes. So the funny thing about Wankels is that you can have... I was just kidding. (laughs) No, but it's real. There's actually um, four rotor Wankels in like... I want to say it was the early 90s. Mazda had a race car that had four rotors in it. Four spinning Doritos. One spinning Dorito is impressive. Two is really impressive, but then you just add two more to that, and that's four spinning Doritos. It's like a whole half a bag of Doritos. Exactly. And then you add turbos on it, and now we're talking serious wankle power. (laughs) Yeah. Wow. 
I know, this is real life. But yeah, people basically just add rotors. Most rotary engines are two rotors, and that makes the 1.3 liter. But there's a lot of people that make three rotor engines. You can usually import them from overseas because in Japan they have a couple cars with three rotor engines in them. So people will import them here and put three rotor engines in Mazda RX-7s, and now they have a bigger, small engine that makes more power and it's louder and awesome. Wow. Yeah. Okay. It's a lot of fun. When you talk wankles, you're talking a good time. <laughs> You're making all of this up. I don't believe I know. any of this. It sounds like a completely fake Wankles story. Wankles and Doritos and I know. If picking I... up engines and running down the street with them. Okay, maybe I just need to bring a Wankle in and I'll 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 show you I'll show you my Wankle. <laughs> don't show... <laughs> I don't want no. Maybe don't that show me your that came out wrong. I can bring in a piece of a Wankle engine that I have and I will explain the spinning Dorito and okay. it'll make so much more sense. Oh, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, I think I think you're really gonna like it. I think once you go Wankle, you don't go back. That's the problem. <laughs> You always want more Wankel. <laughs> what have I already told you about my yellow Le Mans? About how you got it? No, I don't know that. Okay, so it's actually sort of an interesting story. Actually, I do have a legit question for you. Okay. Out of all vehicles, what makes the Le Mans so cool, and why did you choose it? That's a solid question. I'm a big fan of that body style car. They made that body style from 68 to 72, what they call um, A bodies. Mm -hmm. General Motors made this. That's GM. Exactly. It included all the different brands that GM owns. So there's Buicks, there's Pontiacs, there's Chevys, mm -hmm. and Oldsmobile. They basically all made the same car from 68 to 72. They all are sort of the same thing. They just look a little different on the outside. So I was a big fan of the 68 to 72 A bodies. And somebody offered me a 72 Le Mans, which is a 72 A-body. I lived on the same street as this car for probably like 10 plus years. Bright yellow, it's rusting, it looks worse and worse every single year. And I used to drive by it all the time and this car was sitting in the woods and it was up against these pine trees and it just looked sad and lonely. I would tell my wife that I want that car. I'm gonna knock on the person's door, offer them some really low amount of money, and hope that they take it. For 10 years, I would tell her this. And then one day, the car disappears. And I am devastated. <laughs> Some other guy knocked on his door and got that car. <laughs> so in my head, I have this like horrible situation where somebody beat me to it and they got a sweet deal. That was not the case. After it disappeared, I decided to put my motorcycle up on Craigslist and offer it up for trade because it wasn't worth a lot of money, but I figured somebody might trade me something interesting for it. That motorcycle was a 1988 Honda Hawk, which it's like a cult bike, sort of like Fieros or Corvettes. They're really a niche market. And this motorcycle was the same way, but I had customized mine to kind of look like a spaceship, custom in every single way you could imagine. So I put it on Craigslist and I said, I would like to trade this for some interesting vehicle. Mm -hmm. This kid, he reaches out to me and says, hey, will you trade your motorcycle for a 1972 Pontiac Le Mans? And I was like, yeah, I definitely would. Can you send me some pictures? He sends me the pictures and I'm like, no way. It's, it's the same Mans. car. Wow. It looks just as sad. It's sitting in a different location. The thing looks awful. Obviously, yeah, I'm going to trade for this because I'm a crazy person and I would trade a perfectly good motorcycle for a terrible 72 <laughs> Le Mans. I went to go look at it. It was just as terrible as I imagined it to be. It needs everything. But we decided to trade. I got the car. How long have you had it? If I had to guess, September mm -hmm. of 2017, maybe? It hadn't run in, I would say, 10 plus years. It was pretty rusty. It still is. I haven't done anything to the body. I basically, I fixed the brakes on it, and I added a bunch of missing parts because it was missing, like, the headlights and taillights and random things, trunk lock, so the trunk wouldn't close. The hood wasn't attached to it and things like that. So I kind of got it to a base point where it was looking like a car again. And then I rolled it into my garage, immediately got rid of the engine. I then got a new engine. A wankle? Not a wankle. <laughs> and the new engine was blown up. And then so you I, took a perfectly working engine yeah, out that of engine worked, Mans, right? I, and you put a piece of crap well, into I the piece of crap. Yes and no. Okay. So first what I did was I took the good engine out of the car, and then I rebuilt the bad engine, mm -hmm. and then I put that into the Le Mans. Fuel injected, 2001, 6 liter, LQ format. Whoa. Yeah. What does that mean? It's basically a Chevy Silverado engine. It's got 300 horsepower-ish. Well, it did when it was new. 
which is a huge improvement over the old engine, which was like 140 horsepower. Uh-huh. One makes twice the horsepower of the other. It's awesome. And it all, it all is because of the efficiency of the engine. In 1972, they were just starting to get into like emissions sort of stuff. So they were really choking off the power of the engines. In like the 60s, they would just make as much horsepower as they could because why the heck not? Nobody cared about emissions. But then the early 70s come and people start caring about how much exhaust is coming out of a car. So they start choking the engines with all this emissions stuff and that reduces the horsepower. So now 40 years pass and suddenly they can make an engine that is exponentially more efficient and it makes twice the horsepower because it's more efficient. I hope to have it running within the next week and then I'll have fuel injection, 300 horsepower, and I'll be able to do some burnouts in a ratty looking 72 Le Mans. <laughs> I don't even want it to look nice. Like a lot of people would get this car and be like, I want to restore this and make it beautiful and take it to car shows and win some trophy or something. Not but yet. I want none of that. <laughs> I want to basically have a reliable engine and I want to be able to do burnouts in it. I want to just melt the tires off it for as far as I can see and not care about it at all. I want to park it in the grocery store parking lot. And if minivans swing their door into it, I don't want to care about it. Mm-hmm. I just want it to be reliable, no frills, burnout machine. It's ugly and it's loud, oh. but it's mine. Matt, I hear you're starting to work on some cars. I'm trying, Jeremy. <laughs> Did you know that One Auto actually carries over 5,000 helpful how-to videos? Really? Maybe it just got easier for me. I think it did. So you can actually buy the auto parts from oneauto.com, but you can also watch all of their videos showing you how to install the parts on your car. That's really smart. It's pretty awesome. And they have amazing customer service that you can call on the phone or, of course, email if, or chat if that's your thing. And then they have fast shipping. Great. And they ship it from within the United States. Fantastic. And the customer service is in the United States. That's amazing. So it's pretty much a complete package. If you need to get your car fixed, you go to oneauto.com, you get the parts, you get the how-to installation videos, and you don't even need to bring it to a mechanic because you can just do it yourself and save a bunch of money. Wow. The parts and the videos. Yeah. It's like mac and cheese with barbecue sauce. Exactly, Matt. Mac and cheese and barbecue sauce. Amazing. <laughs> Hey, Matt, do we have any emails from our listeners? Absolutely not, Jeremy. This is the first time we've done this. Oh, yeah. So in the future, we are actually going to get some questions from our listeners. If you want to diagnose your car, that's cool. If you want to ask us for mac and cheese recipes, that's fine, too. That's great. So for now, I guess we're just going to make up some questions. Cool. Is it worth trying to refinish my headlights, or should I buy new ones? Ooh, that's a good one, Matt. I've actually done both, and I can tell you that... If you refinish your headlights, you can buy like a refinishing kit or you can be a little more creative and you can you can clean headlights toothpaste, a variety right? of ways. Yeah, toothpaste or you can use like rubbing compound, which is like something you use to buff a vehicle with. You can use 1500 grit sandpaper. You can use a whole bunch of different things. Anything with a little bit of grit to it, you can pretty much polish the headlight and you'll end up with a clear lens. The problem is that after like a month or two, your headlight looks exactly like it did before. Mm. It's yellow and it has these micro cracks in it and it just looks terrible and the light doesn't shine through it anymore. Although like it might be great for a used car lot that may be just trying to flip a car real quick and make it look pretty, Ooh, point. it's not going to last any period of time. Right. And you don't want to do that every Yeah, every you don't, couple exactly. Weeks. Especially with the effort involved in it because you're sitting there polishing a headlight. It's literally a terrible job. Yeah. Assuming the price is reasonable on a, on a new set of headlights, which in most cases it is, unless you have some kind of exotic car, for the most part, headlights are very reasonably priced and you can get a pair of them pretty easy online. The thing is, a lot of headlights are super easy to replace too. They have two or three screws in them and it's a very easy do-it-yourselfer job to do. You think I could do it, Jeremy? I think you could easily do it, except maybe on a Cadillac CTS. I'm going okay. to rule that one out. Because that one, you got to remove bumpers and stuff. It's eh, problematic. What if I look up a video on how to do it? If you looked up a video for a Cadillac CTS, yeah, you could definitely do it yourself. There's a few cars that are more difficult than others, but there's even some that don't even have any screws in them. You literally lift up a clip and oh, yeah. the whole headlight like falls out of the car. It's, Those are my kind of headlights. Yeah, it's amazing. There's a few manufacturers that have done that now, and it makes it super easy to replace the headlights. It's like they knew 
the headlights were going to be junk in a few years, and they wanted to make them easy to replace. That was um, nice. Yeah, <laughs> very forward thinking. So yeah, I would say if you have the option, I would certainly go for a new set of headlights. They'll last way longer than polishing the old ones, and it's a very do-it-yourselfer friendly job. So I would definitely go that route. This is the noise segment. Noise. What is that noise? Oh. oh that's What's a, that noise, Jeremy? That's a bushing of some variety. Maybe a strut mount? Uh, I'd go with like a strut mount, probably. Could be like a control arm noise, but probably a strut mount. That's very strut mounty. One more time. Oh. It, it's either a haunted house door. <laughs> it could be a haunted house door. <laughs> or... It's got to be some sort of rubber bushing that is, like, worn out and terrible. Ding, ding, ding! It was it. a bushing. Yep. It actually sounds a lot like a strut mount, too, though. Strut mounts make that same noise. You'd probably only hear it inside the car, though. That sounds like it's from outside the car. That's the noise that you don't want to hear if you own the car and you're driving <laughs> it. You're like, ooh, this is expensive. This is especially not the first noise you want to hear when you <laughs> yeah. buy a car. Things are worn out. Let's try another one. Let's see what we can find here. <laughs> what is that noise, Jeremy? Uh, <laughs> um, I would say it is a starter solenoid clicking, but it could be caused by a bad starter solenoid, a bad starter, or a dead dying battery. Let's let's hear it again. Oh. Yeah. So... Sounds really good, whatever it is. Yeah, that's definitely... It sounds starter-ish. I, I'm going to go with a starter solenoid is technically what is making that noise. Well, it's, you'd you'd be right. You nailed it's it. It's a very, very standard noise. Okay. Nope, that's just me driving. Never mind. <laughs> is that you driving a car, Matt? <laughs> it is, Jeremy. Wow. Three for three. What's that noise, Jeremy? Can I hear it again? Gosh, that's tough to tell. I don't know. It sounds like it's muffled and weird. Um, Have we perhaps stumped the Jeremy? Uh, no. I'm going to blame the audio clip. I don't know. I think I can't really tell what that is. <clears throat> well, Jeremy, it's a muffler. Really? When you said it was muffled, oh. <laughs> that's funny. I guess you win. Yeah, that's that's weird. Let's listen to it again. Oh, uh, okay. I guess I hear it now. Okay. Yeah, you can kind of hear the the engine kind of doing its thing with a with a hole in the muffler. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. I think if it was in person, I would have got it. Hmm. If I could be next to the car, breathing the fumes. Is that a lawnmower? What's that noise, Jeremy? <laughs> so... <laughs> okay. I... Now, now we stumped the Jeremy. We had no, to. Well, it, it sounds like a fan hitting something. So like <laughs> a fan hitting a fan shroud or like a blower motor with like a, a nest in it or like a... Maybe the cabin air filter is hitting the blower motor, or... That is weird. Um... We'll give it to you. Yeah. It's, that's a dying blower motor. Okay. At the end of its life. Huh. So was the, the fan, the blower motor cage actually broken in that case? No. Huh. Wow. It was probably that's super a, old and yeah. it was probably rattling around a little bit. And that's, a noisy, that's a noisy blower motor. Yeah. I'm glad that that is not my vehicle. 
Well, that wraps up our What's That Sound game. Yeah, I think I did all right. I think you did really good, Jeremy. I mean, I mean considering it was uh, coming out of a phone, uh, I wasn't next to the vehicle. I feel like I feel like I did all right. Yeah. I know you weren't prepared for that. Yeah, it was it was out of the blue. I wasn't expecting it. Thanks for listening to our first episode of Engine Noise, sponsored by 1AAuto.com. Quality parts that ship quickly. Oh, you're catching on, Matt. Yeah, and I just ordered a headlight. It was pretty simple. Always is. I think this went well, Jeremy. I think it did too. And we have another episode that's available right now. Make sure you find us on the podcast network machine. (laughs) (laughs) Basically just punch the subscribe button. (laughs) You'll find it. (laughs) Mash that button. And thanks to Jamie Prohaska, our producer. And Patty Ford, our editor. And until our next episode, just fix it yourself. Yeah, DIY. Fix it. Get it done. Get in there, turn some wrenches. Get your hands dirty. Spin that screwdriver. We believe in you. Put some muscle in it. Make sure you put the car in park and put blocks in the tires. Yeah. Be very careful. Park and brake. Use it. Don't even lift your vehicle, actually. Never mind. This Engine Noise podcast is brought to you by 1AAuto.com. Hit the subscribe button now and stay up to date with all the new episodes. Have a question for Jeremy or Matt? We'd love to hear from you. Send us an email at enginenoisepodcast at gmail.com. Mm-hmm.